um, we are, yeah, we're being recorded. So uh, feel free to not show your face or if you want to show your face, have your camera on, it's up to you. But just to warn you, we are being recorded. Um, if everyone could keep their microphones muted when they're not talking, just so you don't get all the, the background noise. And um, we're going to have a, a sort of a panel discussion and introduction, which B will tell you all about. And at the end, we'll leave time for everyone to ask questions and things. So if you want to ask questions, you can press the raise your hand button to speak and unmute yourself or uh, write it in the text box if you feel more comfortable and we'll try and read them out that way. And um, yeah, thanks for coming too. So over to me. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I will start from um, uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, about the show that is linked um, uh, to this event. Um, um, maybe some of them, some of you read uh, the description uh, uh, of the event uh, online. Um, and I don't really necessarily want to uh, repeat myself again, but it is linked to the uh, uh, show and that I put together for the gallery lock in uh, with um, uh, my amazing and talented uh, studio mates. <laughs> and we created a collaboration. Um, we called it In the Void, a, a, a year of um, uh, producing work in isolation. Um, um, with a background of working in lockdowns, um, uh, our collective couldn't, uh, uh, was a new collective and we couldn't meet. Um, so we spent a lot of time uh, discussing how to avoid one another. Uh, <laughs> in the studio, we couldn't work at the same time, so we had to uh, create a schedule uh, and work one at a time uh, throughout the lockdowns um, because of the restrictions. Um, uh, so the uh, idea of uh, putting putting something together, a bit of normality as an artist uh, uh, after this year of uh, uh, strange maybe experiences, and we will all talk about it. So, uh, I'm sure everyone did have different experiences, but it wasn't uh, um, something we, that we experienced before maybe, or um, uh, used to deal with. Uh, I never before had to create a schedule to avoid people uh, in the studio space. <laughs> um, and coming into the studio uh, one at a time, you do see the changes and it's kind of like a secret life of studio uh, that things do change and new work um, uh, appears. But uh, uh you don't really see anyone so it's a bit ghostly <laughs> and a bit unsettling and also working um, um uh, one at a time brought me to the idea of uh creating a collaborative piece and instead of working on separate uh, uh separate pieces to work on one um on one painting with other artists and instead of discussing uh what we are about to do or what we are doing is to create a conversation through our visual uh, languages and very distinctively different uh, uh, different uh, languages so uh, there was no um, uh, planning uh, for uh, this uh, collaborative piece um, and the rules were we continue continue working for two weeks uh, until the end so we don't decide in the middle that this is it and we stop we continue this conversation uh, for the duration of two weeks um, and uh, today it will be the first time that we will uh, discuss our experiences uh, working uh, on this piece and still working in isolation but having this um, um, interesting conversation through visual languages. 
And uh, to bring this conversation together, I invited amazing people um, to lead the panel. And I would like, uh, first of all, to introduce um, uh, the wonderful panelists. Um, Tuna Erdom and Seda Ergul, um, hi, is a London-based artist, curator, and producer duo. They make art under the name of Istanbul Queer Art Collective, while they produce and curate as queer art projects. They founded Istanbul Queer Art Collective in 2012 to engage in live art with a view that the documentation of performance is an art form in itself. They are firm believers in what Jack Halberstam calls the queer art of failure and what Renat Lorenz calls radical drag. Their performances range from the durational to the intimate and can morph towards other forms like sound or installation. Queer Art Projects was founded in 2017 to produce and curate exhibitions, performance events, screenings and talks, mainly focusing on queer and migrant art. In 2018, they produced the House of Wisdom exhibition, which showcased 40 international artists across four venues in Nottingham. In 2020, they curated and produced an online exhibition, hashtag WIP, Work in Progress or Working Process, that um, featured 37 artists selected by six curators presenting finished artworks side by side with the various stages of their creation. Their latest project, uh, Galatea, is an art council founded performance project about monuments and the six new performance videos commissioned for the project. And it, they will be exhibited as part of the Every Woman uh, Biennial at London between 1st and 10th of July. So, uh, yeah something to keep an eye on. And I would like to add uh, from myself that um, crossing paths with uh, um, uh, work of Tuna and Sada definitely influenced, I think uh, you, you, you will see my own, uh, um, if not practice, but approaches uh, to my uh, curate uh, this production, definitely, I would say, because um, taking part in um, um, hashtag WIP and thinking about the processes behind um, uh, definitely influenced my desire to record my collaboration uh, for In the Void. And uh, uh, we will watch it in just a um, um, short time. And next, I would like to introduce you to Nadine Feinzer, um, previously known for her paintings, which engage with a mobile territory of abstraction and figuration. In the last few years, Nadine has turned to drawing to explore the subject matter of violence to the body and abuse of power within the domestic setting and wider society. She was senior lecturer in the fine art painting department between 2014 and 2018 at the University of Brighton and taught the artists at this exhibition, indeed all of us. As a long-term sufferer of depression, she recently took part in the BBC Two documentary, The Psychedelic Drug Trial, that follows the participants of the, year, of the last year's Imperial College trial, testing a particular psychedelics psychedelic as an alternative to the conventional antidepressants. She agreed to participate in order to contribute to the current discussion around the treatment and causes of depression. During lockdown, Nadine moved her studio from London back to her hometown of Lewis and formed the new art group with fellow artists living in the locality. The focus of the group being on dialogue supporting each other in the development of practice and engaging with other artists in the wider community. And it is something that uh, 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 I can definitely relate, <laughs> relate to <laughs> and will be very interesting to discuss further. 
Thank you, Nadine, for joining. Um, and the last, Best Frogs, <laughs> who has hosted uh, In the Void. And uh, Beth is a Brighton-based Welsh curator and a gallery director. She has curated exhibitions nationally and internationally and has worked with partners in Italy, South Korea, and China. She has also worked with many award-winning international theater companies and performers as a producer and strives to support artists and musicians who are unsigned and unrepresented. In 2013, she started ongoing project Lock In, a life exploration into the social, psychological, and physical boundaries of the body. The project was set up to provide a platform for artists working in durational performance to open up a critical debate with their live and non-live audiences. Now with a permanent home gallery lock-in, the project also hosts socially engaged visual art exhibitions. And we are very grateful for Beth to host our <laughs> exhibition in the void. <laughs> Um, so I would like to um, uh, um, give a word to Tuna. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be introducing our wonderful artists. Uh, and I'll start with Victoria, who has been talking until now. So you have got to know her if you haven't already. Uh, but let me give... Uh, a bit of a background to that. Victoria Suvorov is a contemporary artist, an independent creator and a researcher whose work focuses on issues of gender, sexuality and the transgression within. Suvorov's multimedia work comes to challenge the preconceptions and connotations of how gender is perceived. Social issues, taboos, and expectations are at the core of Suvorov's work, as well as the meaning of nonconformity to social norms. Current work draws on different personal resonances of what constitutes queer art and what it means to be a queer artist through the continuous explorations of the method of archive and the use of language attributed to queer representations and identities. Suvorov holds an Emrys in arts and cultural research from the University of Brighton. Her interests are in historically accurate terminology applied in relation to women with masculine traits of a time, as well as in investigation of different approaches to non-Western cultures from the Western perspective. Uh, Elia Gribben's paintings use brutal images from MMA fights and wrestling matches to help articulate self-assertion and dignity in abuse survival. The artworks open conversations about violence and show gender identity, masculinity, and control over one's own body in digital age. As a sexual abuse survivor, Depicting fighting bodies and violent images helped Elia confront the triggering imagery directly and reduce the everyday effects of abuse trauma. Practicing martial arts for Elia has been a way to take control of their body and help practice body awareness. The paintings create a contrasting space where fleshy bodies are placed in an alien environment with hard edge structures, blocks of bright color, and parasite imagery. With this contrast, the artist explores human relationship with organic bodies and violence in the digital age. Figures in the paintings are engaging with each other in violent and sensual ways, but framed within the rules of a competition. Performed fighting reflects the violent human condition and the ability to play by the rules. Fight scenes on popular media get lost between real violence and the show. And our last artist, Charlotte Gerard. Charlotte's practice seeks for an abstract narrative suggested in between the layers of paint. She expresses her emotional responses to life, carrying with her memories and nostalgia. By allowing the paint a tendency to slip over the edge of the canvas, 
the space of our paintings confronts forms which enter and leave the surface all at once. Dance and vivacity allow movements amended in the languages of abstraction and figuration. Color leads to instinctive actions, an intimate approach to the surface in the application of secretive touches convey her close attention to the medium in a quiet argument against containment. So these are our artists. <laughs> Welcome all. <laughs> Thank you, Tuna. Thank you very much. Um, I would like uh, to continue with showing you uh, our collaboration. It's a time lapse video uh, of us working on uh, the painting. Um, and um, while you'll be watching the film, uh, which uh, does not have a sound, I would like to have a discussion as the video rolls, uh, rolls out and uh, Beth will uh, kickstart the questioning or discussion. And I will share my screen. Um, one second. Can I just say as well to those who've joined us, thanks very much for coming along. And um, just to let you know, this is being recorded, so you're welcome to have your camera on or off. And there will be opportunities to ask questions at the end after the panel discussion. So please feel free to raise your hand or write them in the comments and we'll, we'll get through them. So thanks for joining us. There we go. So if I start off the questioning, well, uh, V gets that sorted. Uh, so basically, I mean, from my time spent in the gallery watching the artists work and talking about it, I have loads of questions and loads of people have asked me to pass on questions. So it's difficult for me to know where to start because I kind of want to jump to the end and ask questions about the finished piece, but I also want to know about the process. So I think I'll start from the beginning or the midpoint maybe. So I want to ask the artist because this is something that I mean I find really personally difficult so you made yourselves work all the way through to the end of the two weeks did you ever come in one day and you just couldn't bring yourself to change it because you thought it was done how hard was that to make yourself work and to force yourself to do something different uh shall I start with Charlotte maybe because you've done quite a lot of big changes <laughs> when you uh, doing this. absolutely and actually was the one uh, who started the piece from fresh and I was also the last mark on the collaboration um, but there definitely were days where the more the collaboration would progress the later it would get it would be difficult to reapproach the surface because there was so much information on it already that it felt completed in a way that you wouldn't want to overgo onto someone else's mark even though that was the whole point of the process it was kind of like discussing from one mark to another um by applying on top of the previous layers um but yeah i think um the first initial entering in the gallery seeing how different the piece looks and deciding to actually get started and do something had to become something quite inst uh, instinctive and not really thought through i had to kind of just like go and do a line because as soon as I had done something it was kicked off to be able to do something um but yeah that was tricky nice and uh, same to Elia then same question because Elia um you strike me as your work is quite it seems to be quite predestined and pre-planned whereas Charlotte's is quite expressive and intuitive Elia you, you seem to I don't know plan the compositions I don't know a lot, lot of time before so how did you find that how was that for you um yeah that's a that's a good question i think uh i think i had to pre before this event even started i had to really put myself in the mind space to to not think of the work to look visually in a certain in a certain way so i think throughout every time i would come in i had to put myself in a headspace to to look at it as as something that Ha that doesn't have a specific a specific way it's supposed to look and and of course uh, at first it was really it was quite scary but but 
but I just I don't know <laughs> that's that's a hard one because yeah I guess I just tried to uh take each day how it goes and yes it, I just needed to put myself in the headspace and I think yeah I think it's a hard thing for every visual artist to do to not think of it as a like a like a visually effective piece of work but instead just I don't know look at the process yeah I guess that would be my answer <laughs> yeah yeah definitely a challenge uh, V how about you um well it was a organic process not only in terms of working but in terms of planning because it was um a uh, commitment for a whole month and we were working on the painting for two um uh, out of this four weeks um and it was difficult to predict how busy uh, the artist would be and uh, in which order artists uh, will be working so everything that you can see the order of the uh, in which we are uh, creating was uh, in a way organic as well which is quite interesting um, uh, and uh, sometimes um, uh, it it happened that uh, I felt that I'm having a conversation with myself a little bit when I was uh, doing shift after shift. And if uh, 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 I sometimes felt that I'm getting myself in a knot and that I'm not sure uh, where, what I'm doing at all, <laughs> uh, kind of stomping in the dark. So yes, it was, uh, it was um, uh not always easy for me i think i found uh, responding to uh something new and unexpected uh very exciting um and in a way easy easier rather than uh um responding to m myself almost in this situation because i had no idea what i'm doing uh, so it was um, it was a kind of natural natural response and um, uh, maybe one day and think oh no it's done it's finished <laughs> and you still had three more days to go or something uh, I, I uh, um, sometimes I did look look at it and I thought oh this is great but we have to keep going because <laughs> this is this is uh, um, uh, these are the rules <laughs> of the yeah, collaboration. V, it's interesting. Do you would you remember maybe at which point you thought, "Oh, that looks really good," as in it should be done? Because I had this thought too, and I think it might have been midway through, maybe. Um. Now maybe it's it's a bit more difficult to judge, but yes, maybe somewhere midway through it felt mm -hmm. like, okay, it looks pretty done and people were coming in and the feedback you were receiving from the audience uh, that, oh, that's, that's done. But you're like, oh no, we have another week to go. <laughs> <laughs> we have another week of painting and um, um, we did talk about it. What happens if you run out of space, right? Um, and uh, yes, we just agreed that we keep working over. So everything is happen happening in this space. Yes, Nadine. Um, yeah, I was really interested in um, almost the kind of the difference that there must be in the, in the way of seeing it. Normally you, you have some kind of aesthetic judgment going on, but here it's a kind of durational piece. And I know when I um, went to the gallery and chatted to Elio, you know, we were talking about this uh, sort of almost like having a different form of vision or a different kind of sight um, that, yeah, you, you put to one side to an extent, you, you see the aesthetic, you see the composition and, and yes, it would look lovely at this point, but it's durational, it's a whole different uh, kind of time of painting. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to ask maybe Charlotte about that, that notion of time in painting. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think especially because of the way of uh, my 
my way of approaching the work is very intuitive and it's generally quite fast. Um, so even though I, I usually work on a large scale, which is not dissimilar to this one, and um, it's like bold, very gesturally and nearly performance or dance manner of, um, of painting. So the fact that this kind of was an ongoing process and there was some more intimate, precise elements coming within the painting, it felt like my time of bringing these larger marks were kind of condensed within so much information. Um, and I think by the end of the work, what I um, started to be doing, which is something that I'm actually doing in parallel in my own practice at the moment, is rather than having bold, uh, quite matte um, marks would be washes over something else. So outlining an area um, and filling, filleting, uh, filling in with uh, acrylic paint really diluted in water, which meant that you still had a veil um, going above the rest of the marks. Um, so I think that this is definitely a way of me for killing time in a way or making it, making it like a slower process rather than something very bold and um, expressive. So Charlotte, are your paintings over quite quickly then, usually? Um, yeah, they tend to be, but this is, again, this is something um, that I have been working on in the past year on the couple of series of works I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more this idea of, it's interesting that, that you point this out because it really is something that I've tried and focus on. And um, I don't know if it's because of this idea of coming out of university not long ago and not necessarily having the same um, means or the same quantity of work to be able to work on. I had to put more time and you know pressure into thinking of a piece as a piece in its duration. So um, I think it was oddly kind of part of the experimentation I am going through anyway. Um, but yeah, my pieces are usually faster, but slowly going to maybe washes and slower process. Um, I was also, one of the things that struck me was that you could see um, the painting sort of going through a kind of emerging sort of violence um, towards the marks. Um, and at the end, there's certainly this sense of compression and contortion um, and, and uh, the emerging, well, there is, a, it's not even emerging, it's quite clear there's the arm coming down. Um, B, I wondered if, if you, if that's something that you thought about or, or am I kind of way off um, on that interpretation? Uh violence uh, well maybe when you have to come in and uh, um, work or respond in the same space to um, something quite different to what you are isn't it it all becomes very um, uh, I mean is, is it clashing or is it coming together the whole the whole process uh, maybe was a kind of transformation and maybe within it there is some form of violence in itself isn't it of when certain things appear and disappear and transform and maybe some of this transformation it's very radical in a way um, um, it's kind of destructive isn't it i suppose it's kind of like is it a dance or is it a fight you know, maybe it's both because on one side it's kind of destroying what came before it, but on the other side it's kind of making it better and in, you know, improving upon it. So. I wondered if I could say something. Um, uh, as a painter, I c I'm astonished by the feeling of lack of control that this project gives the artists involved. You know, I, I'm very uh, tight rigid controlled painter uh, hard edge painting and i really resist any kind of um collaboration because i like solitude and control i suppose and just the feeling that you all had to let go of that 
and that you you know you might be really happy with the work you've done and then you come in next time and it's just completely <laughs> disappeared and uh, i just find that i wonder I'd, I'd be interested to know how you know the different artists involved felt about that surrender of control if you're not usually collaborators i don't know if you are collaborators or you know and you're used to that process i just was interested in that feeling should we go to elia for that one first i think that's Mm. Okay, <laughs> uh, but the first thought that came to me about surrendering control is because uh, I, I did not necessarily look at the Elia, you've muted. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, something that is like mine and I have some control over i i try i i feel like every time i would come in i would see as something that's brought to me and uh, that we sort of created and i have a chance to work on it and work around it because uh like i did quite a few like spray painted blocks of things and the way i the way i would work is i work around the shapes that are already there uh so that was really helpful so instead of i don't know instead of trying to pressure the shapes that i make i felt like i was really happy to find the new shapes and uh, uh and i i don't know but i did not have really this problem but maybe it was because i already had a mindset of uh this is not gonna be my work and it's not i cannot it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be a process that we talk about and I don't know how about other people, but for me, knowing that there's, if it's filming and knowing that we're going to talk about it, made me feel like it's uh, whatever we're putting on top, it's not, uh, or whatever we're changing, it's not going to be lost because we're going to be talking about it. And we're, so the final piece is not, yeah, it's not going to be the only, the only piece. So I don't know, that just happened for me, but, but of, yeah. Would be different, I guess, if we I was uh, we were already working on a finished piece that I've made rather than creating a piece together. I don't know. Elio, were you uh, and Z, were you aware of the camera being present? Because I kind of forgot most of the time. Like I put it on, but I'd then forget that it was here. Um, I was uh, turning the camera on when I was working and uh, because the shifts uh, were usually five hours at a time um, it, it is just impossible to walk in and paint for five hours uh, straight with uh, uh, visitors coming in um, as well because it, uh, sometimes people would ask questions uh, and there were um, you know other interactions um so may maybe i wasn't i wasn't thinking about it when i was when i was working uh i wasn't very self-conscious because maybe i was with my back to the camera as well <laughs> um so it's not like i didn't i didn't necessarily feel that i was performing but uh when i will stop working i turn the camera off uh so i don't know um, partially. <laughs> so um, I've got another question. If sorry, I'll ask another before sending out more <laughs> opportunities to the panel. Uh, my question just kind of occurred to me then because we were talking about um, well, Elia was talking about the film and the fact that we're going to talk about it, and this you know all about the process of what we're interested in. Is the final piece irrelevant? Does it matter? You know, it was all about the the process and the work and the existence and the length is this whole is this irrelevant the final object um i don't know it's it's interesting as a question i think uh like i remember thinking when i came in that day because i must have been there the day before too um that i didn't particularly want to add anything to it and that it was done so I believe it was on the last day that I um, turned the canvas around 
as this is something that I do in my practice, um, just shifting the, the surface and finding new angles. Um, so in a way that was kind of a way of also adding my mark um, by flipping everyone else's work around too. Um, but then I kept painting and I painted until, you know, the last minute until the end of the shift. And it wasn't really about looking at the outcome. It was just this idea of the continuity and the duration of the process having to start from the start and finish at the end. And I kind of felt committed to um, do that regardless of the visual um, quality, mm. I guess, of, of the outcome. So you felt committed that you, you had to, you paint, you couldn't just um, be with the painting or um, sit in silence or meditate or something like that. No, and I also think part of that is the idea of, um, you know, craving the act of painting in a way and knowing that this was a surface that was, that was giving me the opportunity to do that and being quite with it. Um, and um really and to apply the paint on the canvas and it was kind of the clock was ticking in a way which um it wasn't about i have to finish the painting for this time it's i want to be painting until the last minute i, I wondered actually whether um you all felt a commitment to one another um responsible in some way yeah definitely mm. V, do you want to talk a bit more about that as well? About the sort of the coming together and the yeah commitment. Of course. So, you put it. Uh, so yes, it all um, uh, links. So the final uh, the final outcome of the collaboration. I was looking at it as a conversation. So uh, making parallels. What what do you come out with after having conversation with someone? And what what. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it is quite interesting to have this conversation in, with a visual language where you can look at the uh, outcome um, as an aftermath. But um, as um, uh, going back to what Tuna and Seda are saying about the commentation of performance as a kind of art form in itself, uh, so the process was uh the key for me with this collaboration um definitely not not uh the outcome that neither of us could envisage uh so how can something be important of an importance that you don't even uh, understand or know what uh what it will be <laughs> um as uh, beth you said i think uh, that you kept coming in and thinking oh someone will just paint it all over white and it will go back to its original form almost uh, <laughs> uh, which didn't happen but it it could have i suppose yeah this whole thing could have been a secret <laughs> uh, captured on film <laughs> well it wasn't <laughs> So maybe Tuna and Seda, what do you think in terms of your uh, thinking about process and documentation? What, what's your comment on this? Well, as performance artists, this to us looks very much like a performance rather than a painting, uh, because the way it has been arranged is exactly how we work as performance artists. And this whole thing about um, giving up control is exactly what we do as performance artists, uh, basically. But whenever we do that, uh, what we are opening ourselves up is to some sort of chance operation. And this uh, sort of mechanism that uh, you use um, reminds me of like the Dadaist paintings when uh, uh, Exquisite Corpse, uh, where uh, one paints uh, on top of another, but without seeing it. So again, it's all about chance coming through and uh, without even knowing it, you're expressing something and all that kind of understanding. I, what I find very interesting about this is that it's not to chance that you're opening up, it's to each other. Uh, so it's not just a mechanism that you're creating and letting it happen. It is indeed a very uh, direct form of communication. 
Um, and in that sense, uh, chance has very little to do with it. I mean, whenever uh, you're deciding, I would assume, in doing anything, you know that you're doing it to someone <laughs> as well as to the canvas. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the first uh, questions that came to my mind when I was looking at, uh, at it was about care, basically, uh, because this whole project has come out of uh, uh, trying to care for each other when you can't be together with uh, each other. And here you're uh, looking after each other's work when they're not there. This has gone to the extreme of that. Uh, so um, I guess what I would be most interested in here is uh, that individualistic desire to express yourself clashing uh, with caring about someone else's expression and how to sort of um, enhance someone else rather than trying to express yourself. That kind of dynamic uh, open, would, to me, uh, it resembles more like opening yourself up to a spectator when you're performing. Uh, again, this is like opening to chance, but then you're allowing the spectator to do whatever they want to your work, to yourself even in some situations. So that radical kind of connectedness is uh, sort of uh, not leaving yourself to chance, but leaving yourself to your uh, colleagues and co-workers and friends uh, when they're not there. I think is what is so uh, moving about this, and especially in terms of uh, isolation. Uh, I don't know, so I would like uh, ask, what I'm trying to ask is uh, basically, um, first of all, let's start from the very basic uh, question of, uh, did any of you have in mind what you might be doing when you came each day? Or did you just work from what you encountered? Uh, was there any moment where you did something and wished for a moment that no one would cover it up? Uh, does it change what you make when you know that it might be so temporary? that no one might, uh, someone might not even see it except the person that comes after you. Uh, does it change the way you paint? Uh, knowing that it might not be as permanent as uh, you would want it to be. These are the kinds of questions that I want to uh, know. And uh, yes, as a performance artist, I really want to know if you, whether you ever thought of it more as a performance than a painting as well. I talk too much. No, it's great to be for that one to answer first. Uh, what is this? Why? Huh, okay. okay. Uh, 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 are we going to wait for the answers or shall I add something, I mean, before the answers? Oh no, you go, go ahead now, go on. Uh, actually, or oh, I mean, throughout the conversation, all the questions that came to my mind is kind of answered, but uh, I find this whole process is such a mind opener for me because I just tested myself, I mean, uh, through your experience and um, uh, I fail in, <laughs> I mean, in so many points uh, because uh, what we did similar to this uh, was um, actually in the form of writing. Uh, I mean, uh, with a group of artists, uh, we just uh, write uh, a seamless, uh, uh, that we hope a seamless piece. Uh, when you add something to a writing, uh, of course, it kind of changes the, uh, uh, the things previously written uh, because you just uh, intervene the context. Uh, but there is no erasure in our experiments. So erasure, um, I find it kind of very hard to swallow, actually. Uh, I really um, want to try in the form of writing, I mean, with, uh, I mean, with some other artists, collaborating artists. I mean, that uh, this time, uh, maybe we can just erase our 
works and write on top of it. Uh, it would be a completely different experience. Um, I congratulate you. I mean, <laughs> really, I mean, it is, um, it is not just, it is not just caring, it's just uh, letting, I mean, conversation, it is, it is really uh, let go of yourself. Uh, so what I find very interesting here is what Elia talked about uh, a couple of minutes ago. I mean, without the documentation, uh, probably, um, I mean, a doc documentation um, is uh, a relief. Uh, it would be a relief for me. I mean, under these circumstances, I would always think that at least it is documented <laughs> kind of a feeling. I don't know if you felt it strongly, but really, congratulations. I mean, this is a very interesting experiment. It's really my document. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, lovely. So, V, do you want to start answering that then? Because this is kind of your, your okay. concoction or idea. <laughs> I guess the idea, the idea came in the middle of the night, <laughs> um, uh, only a few days before the um, uh, end of registration to Fringe, um, and for forming it um, uh, was a process that uh, we were all involved in uh, as a as a collective, and uh, maybe we did not. Uh, entirely know or could understand what we are getting ourselves into um, um, yes so that was that was very new uh, but it was exciting for all of us from <laughs> from just the responses of talking talking about it and uh, yes there were concerns that we had to navigate about the materials and the materiality of painting because we all have not only very different languages, um, visual languages, but also the materials we are using are very different. And um, uh, we did have to negotiate uh, somewhat uh, about how, how uh, it will become possible to bring it all together. Um, but um, uh, I did. I did feel the care. I didn't think about it, but I did feel the care <laughs> when uh, uh, the artist would come in and whatever was under, it won't be fully visible, but it would still be visible in parts or just glimpses of it. So this conversation for me did happen. Uh, and it was quite quite caring conversation. Maybe therefore I missed it when I had to uh, constantly, um, uh, well, work uh, day after day. Kind of, I did. Uh, I did maybe miss the scare, and maybe it's I missed even human interaction <laughs> in there somewhere. If you can translate it uh, to that, and uh, um, maybe. Uh, maybe Rachel, I can relate to what you're saying about uh, um, the control, and I'm very aware of this nature in me as an artist to and the desire to control everything. And uh, therefore, I think consciously I uh, um, apply uh, methods to break it and and to get out of this comfort zone. Um, um, that's sort of part of my excitement and the development that I'm seeking and maybe now even craving, whereas before, maybe some years back, it, it might have been a nightmare to think about. <laughs> um, so should I, should I pass on, um, uh, Charlotte, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you ask a few questions about, um, did we have any idea of what we were going to do on the piece before coming in? Uh, or was it something quite instinctive when we saw the work opening um, the gallery door? And I think every time, even if I had made something in my mind before I left the gallery, thinking of how it's looking now, um, it would be a complete different response and reaction once the collaboration is literally in your face, because um, it's quite a big piece. So. No, it's always been quite a direct response to um, 
the dialogue that was going on in front of me at the time. Um, I can't really remember what was the two other questions you've had, if you have them in mind. I asked whether there, there was any instant where you wished that some part of it will not be erased. <laughs> that was no, uh, I think quite the opposite. There were parts where I thought, I'm really not pleased with this. I kind of want someone to get over it <laughs> and I'm happy that it will be covered. <laughs> no, definitely not. And especially um, starting it in the first place, I kind of, I was so excited about the idea of all oh, this massive canvas, I can do anything on it, it's fine. And then I really didn't like what I did that day and I thought oh, it's great because it's not going to be there anymore. <laughs> um, no, so no, quite the opposite, yeah. And what was the last question, sorry? Uh, yes, the question was, uh, do you think you paint differently when you know that it's going to be so temporary? Uh, I think um, maybe, yeah, I think so. Even though it's not, I never have, um, like I never permitted what is going to happen within my own work. It kind of happens as the month goes along. I think there was kind of... Um, uh, cockiness in terms of just you know thinking oh well you know I can just go with this color and then if it looks a bit muddy that's okay because it's gonna look different with other people's stones and I thought I had this kind of um, let go and a boost of confidence in thinking I'm going to do things that might be the complete opposite of what I would do in my work maybe things I should not be too precious about or I shouldn't you know overthink and just go and pick the randomest colors that might have been staying in that particular pot for the past week and a half and then just use that because it's there and let's see how that goes so um yeah i think this sense of like let go in the process definitely um became even more and more um was different to the way i would paint so it's kind of a freedom that yeah absolutely and I think again like my process is quite free um in in itself but I think it was this like this idea of it being within the conversation I thought it was just like I approached it with care and respect and I did feel you know a sense of like guilt maybe sometimes if I was going over other people's stuff especially by the end of the work which is why I kind of did washes um on top of other people's marks but um it was just like the excitement of a conversation with me. It made no sense at the end. It was so my, it made my head in. It was, it was giving me a headache because it was so big and there was so much going on. And it was like, Oh, this is funny. You know, this is just, it's fun. So yeah, I like the idea of maybe pushing, even, pushing even more this um, aspect of violence that I saw appearing in the work. And um, there were a lot of, uh, you know, strong information coming, which is so foreign from my own aesthetics. And I think um, I had to hit it even harder in order to, like, step up and be levelled within the whole conversation in the space. Um, I was just going to say, I know, B, you wanted us to try and sort of, before the end, move on um to kind of think a little bit about the context um and the sort of broader context of working in isolation but i, I noticed that richard you've um sent a question maybe we can answer that at the end if that's does that work um because i'm very conscious of the there's almost like this kind of time box where you come and you make work and you know it's almost sort of in space <laughs> Um, but then outside it um, is this incredibly complex environment where, um, you know, gosh, I mean, people, people were dying, weren't they? Um, there was this sort of sense of, of mourning, particularly if you're from, um, you know, an ethnic group where there were much higher rates of poverty or of, of death. Um, there was, you know, people who were vulnerable, who were poor. Um, you know, uh, mental health problems, disability, we're, we're all struggling. People with, uh, you know, artists with very little money 
uh, suddenly found themselves as self-employed, unable to um, survive, you know, and had to sort of give up their practice to find work. So there's, there's kind of a whole context out there as well. Um, there's positive sides as well. I mean, there's been a, an incredible kind of democratization of um, the online art world. Um, people, um, particularly people who are making kind of, I, I guess, uh, more easily saleable work were able to, you know, to actually take to Instagram and um, sell the work directly rather than feeling like they had to go through a gallery. Um, so there has been very positive things, um, greater kind of connection with other people through the internet. Uh, but I wondered how it was for the artists here um, to kind of in a way, I don't know, to kind of reorientate yourselves. Um, does that make sense? V, do you want to take that on? Well, for example, uh, you were saying that uh, when the lockdowns happened, what you've done, you moved your studio close to home because the commute became impossible, isn't it? So how many artists um, had to rearrange the way they work? Mm -hmm. And also you were saying you created uh, a local group mm -hmm. to link artists together. So. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about the group and your experiences? Uh, mm -hmm. So we talked about our experiences as a, a collective, as a studio, uh, mm -hmm. working together. What were um, your experience? Um, I, I suppose I want to, you know, uh, refer a bit back to Seda's comment about care, um, which I think is is really important. Um, and there's the 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 art world can be a, a very competitive and not necessarily um nice place to be um you know and i think for myself uh, there's there's often a kind of ethos that goes against my personal ethos and the way i want to live my life in a a healthy and happy way um and so i think lockdown for me made me feel i wanted to recommit to my locality rather than sort of spreading myself thinly uh, and, you know, always having my eye open there to London or beyond. Um, I, I wanted to reconnect with people I'd maybe not had much contact with for a long time um, and to see what we could do together. So whilst, you know, with digital platforms, you can connect to everyone and anyone anywhere. Um, I actually wanted to do the opposite, which is to care about um, my locality um, and the artists in that area. Um, it was irrelevant to me whether someone uh, was experienced professional amateur or not. It, it, that became irrelevant. What was relevant was that people wish to uh, think creatively and work creatively and to find a way of bringing it back into our everyday lives. Um, and that, that's why, you know, I, I brought these group of people together and it's, uh, it's got a, a fantastic energy, actually. There was just one rule that we had, which was to be, to have generosity, you know, have a generous spirit. So, yeah. Hmm. Um, another uh, comments that I've heard from artists is uh, isolation. It's um, the normal reality for many artists that are working in isolation. But what I'm wondering is if um, when the conditions change and this isolation becomes enforced, how uh, maybe practices or approach uh, or the outlook to that is changing? And I'm wondering if Rachel can actually join in the conversation as an artist. And I know uh, you just said that uh, you are uh, uh, enjoying working in isolation on your own. Yes. And um, uh, how, what was your experience um, during the pandemic? Well, you know, I live in a very rural area in Ireland, so it, not physically things didn't change very much, just less, less visitors, and I don't, ha I don't encourage visitors, so, you know, but what it did make me, and being here today and listening to everyone talk is really lovely and really making me think about my work, and uh, I love, uh, is it Nadine, what you, what, the way you just expressed your interest in 
local artists and local community. And I think maybe what it's made me think about being online so much more, actually talking and listening to artists more than I did before the lockdown, because we're here, you know, um, I don't have to physically go quite a long way to the nearest big gallery to meet people. I can go online. So in a way, it's brought more to me in terms of contact with other artists, which is quite odd, you know. And, maybe, and doing something like this just makes me think I really need artist community, you know, because it, it, and I'm just thinking about how you've all, maybe this will have a really long-term effect on your work as individuals because you've done something so different. And that's always exciting, isn't it? It's to, you know, be pushed somewhere new. Um, yeah, so for me, I suppose it's been a bit of a kind of uh, paradox. I've, I've got more involved. <laughs> so yeah, but I like being involved online because I'm quite introverted and solid, solitary and I like that. So it's great, great to have both. You know, yeah, but I would like while I'm just chatting, I'd love to say thank you to all of you because this has been really um, so interesting and eye opening. It's making me think about the conversation I have with myself in my work, which is, you know, the pri maybe the primary conversation for an artist before anybody else gets involved with talking to ourselves and and how I have and am I listening hard enough to myself and am I pushing myself hard enough so thanks very much very, so interesting uh, and lovely you. generosity I, I love that that's you know uh, my religion is kindness yeah. you know so let's go for it sisters and brothers yeah thank you, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's lovely I think as well um, one thing I come across when I am working with artists who especially just um, finish uni as well they really miss the crits and the get-togethers and the discussion of work and all of a sudden they feel like they're forced out there on their own so they're kind of forced into a loneliness in a big world so there were lots of other people and lots going on but it's kind of a lonely space when you haven't got that you know that makeshift artistic community I suppose that uni provides for you and things and I suppose, Nadine, because you teach painting, you we teach at the uni, don't you? So you're very much, you have that with the artists, but do you ever find that graduates come back to you and say, you know, we really miss that side of things? And what's um, I mean, I'm not teaching any longer, um, but yes. Um, and I, I think I was very conscious. I was actually thinking a lot about um, ex-students and students, because I was thinking uh, lockdown was incredibly hard, um, you know, at a time. Um, where you may not have those kind of connections and you may be being reduced to i don't know living in one room or you know going back to your parents or doing something like that um you maybe don't have a studio you don't have those kinds of contacts so um i was very conscious of how how difficult particularly if you come from another country um you just don't have those contacts so yeah it's um I wish there was a way because I, I just remember when I left, did my degree and left, it was pretty terrifying <laughs> the first three or four years, you know. So, yeah, it's hard. I've lost lost my track. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I know something I try and really sort of promote at the gallery as well is that people getting together and just talking, you know, and meeting people yeah. and having the door open so passers-by can just come and discuss whether they're an artist themselves or not. But I think that's very important, this dialogue with whatever's going on even if it's a display of finished work you know this dialogue but Charlotte gone you're gonna say something. yeah I was going to say it's interesting because um I've graduated uh, last year so last August and actually my um course ended in March so kind of like in the middle of the last year and I haven't really had a conventional way of interacting with the art world uh, even though I've made so much effort and so many ways of trying to connect with people I think something the most basic way of thinking about it is if you know you graduate and you go and see exhibitions and you meet people with private views and you discuss this in person and I haven't had any of this so um, and also one of the things um, quite major which happened is because the course finished in the middle of the degree and everyone kind of split and separated into different areas. Um, I went back to France, sorry for the noise, I went back to um, France to finish my degree and coming back, 
everyone struggled to keep up and to start again because we were all split. We were a very strong group of um, painters working together for two years and a half. And then suddenly everyone is kind of struggling individually. Um, you have lost within a day this whole sense of community, which you've had in a already very structurally helpful um, environment. So I think finding means of bringing people together, especially young artists and finding alternatives to things which seem so daunting, expensive, unapproachable, um, you know, too, too much higher of a level for you in any way. Like, um, that's definitely something to think of and to care for younger artists just coming out of such a particular structure. Um, there has been, I mean, definitely some of the talks and events that I've uh, been attending on Zoom are great because it just means that um, you get to talk to people who could be from, you know, a completely different country or environment. Um, and I think also there's been this sense of generosity within the body of students that um, maybe had graduated before and understood what we were going for. So I followed um, a few crits for about a few months, a crit a week, just a group of artists saying, let's do a presentation each every week, talk about our work and do this. And it's free in comparison to things you find online for the same thing for about 200 pounds, which is like, you know, it's, it's not worth it. So I think small initiatives on small scales continuously uh, may, and making sure it's people from all different levels in the art world and reassuring that, you know, it's not just because you're starting and you have to like kind of go through all the steps and it's gonna, you have to struggle through. I think it's, and especially for um, V to put this exhibition together. I mean, I'm so proud to be sharing a space with uh, previous Brighton graduates. And I think it's great that we have all graduated at different times um, and that kind of, you know, very front, like, first kind of support that I have literally in the space where I'm working um, is very encouraging and uh, it's something I'm very proud to be part of, definitely. Oh, lovely. And then maybe that, I mean, that's got me thinking that maybe art is never a solo pursuit. If there's, you know, all these different kind of communities. I mean, the, the first community really is like you and the viewer or you and your perceived viewer. Yeah. But then from what Charlotte's saying, it seems like there's many more communities and expanding communities. So art's never a solo position, you know, being a, a painter. It's not, it's not you on your own kind of thing. I think Seda, you, you could have nodded your head there, I think, yeah. in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, we have uh, with Seda an ongoing manifesto that we're writing. It's never going to end. And I don't think that anyone will ever read it. It's just for us to understand their arts, basically. But the first, uh, line in that and has been for a while is that any type of art uh, actually needs at least 10 people to come about uh, even if you're like uh, in isolation uh, in the i don't know uh, it, never seeing anyone at all uh, your inspirations uh, your ideas everything comes from what you read what you see what you uh, hear uh, and things like that. So it's never, it's never an individualistic pursuit, even in its most radical form, as far as we're concerned. That's why we decided to create an art collective rather than just go out on our own and do our thing. Of course, performance art does need uh, the others. Uh, you really need that. And I think uh, it hit us very hard uh, the lockdown because we didn't have a live audience because uh, I understand completely how much you embrace uh, Zoom which um, sort of goes over all sorts of uh, artificial uh, barriers between people but when you're performing when you can't feel the energy from the audience which is what you use to keep on doing what you're doing, it becomes extremely very, very difficult. So um, in, in terms of creating, we never think that it can be done on uh, our own. And when we had to migrate uh, to England, uh, our collective, which was like 10, 12 people at times, uh, ended up 
becoming a duo. And then after that, there was a lockdown. And then it seemed as if the whole world was just us. Uh, this kind of shrinking feeling was the worst thing uh, that came out of uh, the pandemic for us. Uh, but we did what we always do uh, and we used it to try and connect with people we wouldn't have connected if uh, there was no such isolation going on, which is how we made that online exhibition, which Victoria was also a part of. So, yeah. Um, yeah, amazing. And um, Elia, I've got a question for you again. I think when you, because your work, your paintings confront very personal issues and they're, you know, quite autobiographical in that sense. When you make these works, do you make them with your viewer in mind or do you make them with you as your own viewer in mind or do you make them quite personally? Because your work, I think, is quite different, isn't it? It's quite, um, yeah, it's all about your experience. Um, oh, well, well that uh, takes, takes me to a whole complete <laughs> mindset, but I, I was thinking about it for some time. I'm not sure exactly whether it's either for me or for the viewer. Uh, it's probably for the, for the, I don't know, for the images. Yeah. It's more for your own viewer as well. So you are a yeah. viewer as well as a maker. Yeah. It's a it's a difficult one because I I know I should be thinking of the viewer and I know I should be but of course it is it's very much for the images and the images already have been processed by people and it's it's a it's a very it's a very complicated one so I don't really know it I think uh, at this very moment especially during COVID since I've been I guess I've been working more than like and not like showing has not been the very important. It's been mostly for me, but it, <laughs> because uh, uh, I don't know, it's been hard. And also, I guess, I don't know, for me, the, the word care kept coming back. <laughs> and I guess I was just thinking about that a lot because um, I don't know, I feel like uh, working, uh, taking our time to talk to each other is actually it takes a lot of effort these days because uh, I don't know I feel like everyone's been going through a lot of very very difficult times so I feel like it took so much care for us to be able to talk to each other and to be able to take the time to come in in the gallery because I remember at some point I had to isolate and and that was really uh, like a disturbed and a lot of other people came in to do the work for me instead and and I felt a lot of and I guess when we were sharing the space it was also very kind because uh, the fact that we did the schedule and the fact that we tried to accommodate each other that was very nice and I know I'm going off topic it's just that it was a hard question I don't know if I'm thinking of the viewer I don't think I don't think I'm thinking of the viewer which I should but uh, I guess at this moment, I'm not really thinking of showing pieces. I'm more doing what I can do. And in general, I guess a lot of, I guess a lot of artists because have been questioning art during this time because I've been working in a care home and it just felt like, like nothing else is important, just my job. And I, in general, decided, like decided that art for me is not important. So, but restarting it and doing it again so i guess it i don't know it just it just made me feel better so i guess it's for me <laughs> it's very selfish but i guess the communication that we have within our uh studio has been very caring so i guess it is for each other as well and the communication that we have now in this in this group of <laughs> talking online also seems very caring so i guess it's about those little interactions i'm not sure if i'm thinking about the broader viewer and i yeah it is very it is very personal so i guess it's mostly for me at this very moment but i guess but a lot of people you know if if they want to take in they can if they like but i don't i don't know i'm not sure yeah. <laughs> it's a hard question i'm yeah. still trying to figure it out <laughs> thank you though mm -hmm. 
that's the thing and there's no right answer or should or anything i mean just putting an aesthetic object or painting out there into the world it's kind of universal because everyone has their own responses to different images and how they work together different colors and things so it's it's for people you know it's for humanity because we all you know look at things and have an aesthetic response so yeah there's no right or wrong answer to that at all but i think they also um artworks have their own life so you can put on it whatever you want, but it will still have its own life. Um. <laughs> and and um, so I'm quite conscious of time because we're coming towards the end. So I was thinking I might pick up on Richard's second question because this is what everyone who I've <laughs> brought to the exhibition really wants to know. Uh, what What are you guys going to do with the the final piece? Is it destruction? Is it keeping it, sell it, like what, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I will answer. Um, we raised this question just because people started asking this question, um, coming to the gallery and asking this question. But um, uh, we are yet to discuss it really and to make our decision uh, on that, I would say. Um, uh, so yes, that's that's where we are. I think it was uh, um, it was quite intense and a big commitment, and uh, everyone uh, weaving the exhibition and participation with everyone's uh, life. So I think uh, uh, this is the last few days of the show, um, and uh, perhaps um, that will be the time to to make our decision and talk about it and maybe uh, I'm looking forward to more conversations. I don't want this uh, to end here uh, in this space, although that's a really for first time um, that we have discussed it in more um, in, uh, in detail. So uh, maybe some of our feelings and uh, uh, concerns um, linked to this experience, but I don't want to be the end. I want it to be maybe the beginning and uh, keep this conversation going and keep this uh, sense of uh, uh, care and support um, uh, that uh, I find quite important. And I really thank uh, um, everyone to making making this happen and making this possible and Charlotte and Elia thank you so much for uh, um, agreeing to that madness <laughs> to begin with and uh, going for it and really it was uh, absolute joy um, uh, working with you um, it's absolutely incredible incredible experience um, um, Thank you, Beth, for giving us the space uh, to make this happen. Uh, we do have a studio, but I wanted to take this experience outside of our private space and take it to the public space. Um, um, and, and thank you, um, uh, Tuna and Seda, so much for uh, your inspiration and being an inspiration and uh, for your continuous support and Nadine for uh, <laughs> bringing up, uh, us up to this point, <laughs> really, as, a, uh, as our teacher and being our guide uh, at different uh, points of uh, our development and st still uh, being here with us. And uh, I really hope that we can continue um, having these conversations and uh, Continue. It goes both ways. It goes both ways. It feeds me as well. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as uh, I became a teacher in the lockdowns, and uh, for me, art uh, with a uh, uh, quite intense uh, teacher's training, art became a form of procrastination. And I, my note, my um, uh, sketchbook was called that a project procrastination. So during the lockdowns for me it was something so privileged i mean i was uh, you know oh that i have studio space to which i could, didn't have time to go or didn't have the ability even to be there but <laughs> just the mere fact that this is s somewhere there but yes it's um, interesting that elia every time looking at the uh, the title of our show uh, 
uh, did see procrastination in between the lines, in between the letters. So uh, in Elio's mind, <laughs> That, that's that, 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 that kind of the most the association. And I said, how interesting, <laughs> because that's procrastination was the key <laughs> term for my art practice <laughs> uh, during the lockdowns. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And uh, I don't want to, uh, if you would like to say a word or, or two, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm looking forward to keeping in touch with all of you. and. Um, uh, keeping this conversation going and this uh, um, sense of community, collaboration, care, if you want. Thank you so I think much. That's a lovely parting comment. I think, you know, the lesson here is keep in touch. You know, everyone, we're all here. Keep in touch. <laughs> so please do. Thank you so much, V, for uh, allowing all of this to happen. And thank you to everyone who came and helped out. <laughs> Uh, lovely to meet you all and good night. <laughs> Thank you everyone who attended the, the event. Thank you so much for coming. And although we didn't hear all of you um, talking, uh, you can appear and wave goodbye. <laughs> uh, bye everyone. Bye. See you. Have a lovely evening.